there is a tension that all of us find our, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a tension we find ourselves, all of us living in at some point in our life. Uh, it's inevitable for us. And the tension that we find ourselves living in at some point in your life and in my life is the tension of when somebody that you respect a lot says one thing and does another, right? I mean, it's unavoidable that you find yourself going, well, now what am I supposed to do with this? What do I do with this? Maybe for some of you, the first time it happened was with a parent where they said, we don't say those words. And you went into your room, you're like, golly. And then all of a sudden you heard them saying those words. And you're like, well, that isn't that convenient, mom. Dad, I won't call all out on the moms. You're like, it's hard. Okay, it's hard. You know, uh, dad, maybe you shouldn't have said that word. Maybe for some of you, it was a little later in life and it was a coach who said, man, if you wanna perform at this level, you can never put this into your body. And then you saw them somewhere putting something in their body and you're like, well, now hold on a second, coach. Maybe for some of you, it's been an employee, employer that you said, this is, this is what I'm gonna tell you and then this is what's actually reality in their life. And it causes a tension in us of going, how do I reconcile that what they say and what they do are different things? The last couple of weeks, we've been looking at the gospel of Matthew and Jesus is coming after the Pharisees, the religious elite of his day, and he's just kind of been going after them, saying, hey, the ways in which you've interpreted my gospel is inappropriate and it's wrong. And really what he does now is he turns their attention towards them with like both guns blazing at them. And he says, really, here's what I'm gonna call out in you, Pharisees, is that what you've been telling the people is simply not what you've been doing. And what's really kind of Jesus is he's just spoke to them, to the Pharisees, the religious elites, and it says at the end of last week, it says that, and they had no more questions for Jesus. So he was speaking to them in such a way that they were like, you know, I don't think we're gonna enter in too much more into what this Jesus guy has to say because we always find ourselves on the wrong end of the question. But the first thing he does is he turns his attention to his disciples. And he says, hey, I wanna warn you against something. How kind of Jesus, right? The creator of the universe to look at those that he loved the most. And he says, I have a warning for you. I wanna tell you what to watch out for. Then he turns his attention from those that are following after him, his disciples, back to those very same Pharisees, and he says, and I'm gonna call out who you actually are. And then at the very end of this morning, he comes back and he says, but here is the hope for both those who could get in trouble and those who are leading others astray. Here's my hope. Here's the kind of God I am. And so this morning, we're gonna be in Matthew chapter 23. If you have your scriptures or if you have a device you wanna be following along, um, I would encourage it. Um, but also, I want you to know from the get-go, this is a long chapter with a lot of things that Jesus is speaking over the people. I am not gonna be covering every single verse this morning because we would be here for much longer than you want to be here. I think it'd be fantastic, but you all would be like, all right, that's enough, buddy. Um, but Matthew chapter 23 is where Jesus starts talking to his disciples, and he's gonna talk about the religious community that they find themselves in, and then he gives us some hope. Ready? So Matthew chapter 23, verse two is where I'm gonna start reading. It says this, the scribes and Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so the first thing that Jesus does is he says what they are doing is actually appropriate. They're speaking the law. Moses' seat would have been the law. And Jesus even tells us, he said, hey, I haven't come to abolish this. I've come to fulfill it. So the, the Pharisees are sitting on that seat, the law that was given. That's where they're sitting. So do and observe whatever they tell you. Like the law that they're teaching is right. Like what God said is true. Observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. Why? For they preach, but they do not practice. So this is where the verse, this is where the phrase comes from. Man, those pra people don't practice what they preach. Jesus is the one that said that. And he was calling it out thousands of years ago to the religious community. And so there's two invitations for you today. Maybe you're here today and you're going, I like Jesus. I like that he would call out the religious community because I'm not sure I'm the biggest fan of the religious community. And I mean this with all honesty and you may be going, well, that's easy for you to say, pastor up there with a mic on your face. But we are so glad that you're here even with your questions. I mean, there is no doubt some of you, even as I talk about the Pharisees of the world, go, man, they're not, they're not gone, are they? I grew up under the Pharisees of this world. And I had some re religious people say things to me that I can't unhear. I had some legalism over my life, whether it was as a young child or whether it's even as an adult, that I still can't shake at times. I'm so glad you're here. 
And I hope that whatever wounds you've carried or words that are just rolling around in your head, that maybe today you would have the freedom, and this would be God's work, not anybody else, but the freedom to just kind of open your hands of going, God, they did say some things and they did put pressure on me and they did say things that I know they weren't practicing. And maybe you've carried that for a long time and it affects every time you come to a church, every time you see something online, you can't help but feel a little bit of frustration, a little bit of sadness in you of the way that you were talked to or the things that were said about your parents. I don't know the stories, but I'm hoping that maybe this morning you can start to just go, Lord, would you help me release that? Lord, would you help me quit attaching what, what some man or some woman historically has done to you. And I get that is a big ask for some of you. To go, you, no, you don't know how wounding it was. I don't. But could I just ask that maybe even as I'm talking about the Pharisees this morning, if you find yourself like clenching, getting frustrated, calling back memories, would you just ever so kindly go, Lord, would you help me release? And maybe for some of you, you spend the next 28 minutes going, Lord, help me release that I have attached a bad view of what a human did to you. And it's not who you are. Others of you in this room this morning, I'm with you. Um, so get ready. It's gonna be really easy to think about that church down the road or that person that we see on TV. Well, at least we're not them, right? Right? Boy, have you heard what they're teaching? Have you heard how they've started going? Woohoo! Wow, those people are off the rocker. Okay, they're not here this morning. I don't think. If you're here this morning and you're another pastor, again, welcome to you too. But um, <laughs> we are here. And maybe, just maybe, for some of us this morning, we need to hear Maybe some of us have taken the masks of the Pharisees, and that's what this message is entitled, and we've put them on ourselves. But then it's so much easier to be like, yeah, of course. I mean, I've got some issues, but I mean, that guy, that person, that ministry, that, and we've become the very people that we don't wanna become. And so I just wanna invite all of us to go, whether you've been wounded or we find ourselves in the seat of the people that are the religious people now, what are we gonna do with this? Do we practice what we preach? What's the problem with the Pharisees? They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, and they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. And so Jesus is saying, they're doing a lot of this for the show. Like a lot of people, they want people to know who they are. They're sitting in seats of authority if we had time to read all of it. And they're asking to like be honored in ways that really, if you're following after Jesus, you wanna do what we just did. Say, no, all glory to God forever. I'm just representing him in this way. And as believers, that's all of us now. But Jesus is saying, watch out for these people. Why? Because they're doing it for themselves. So be on guard. Is, is your following after Christ actually more about you sometimes than about him. Could we be so honest to say sometimes I wanna go, yeah, of course, all glory to God, but I mean, I'm doing pretty well. Anybody wanna notice me? And we just kind of take on the, the masks of the Pharisees. Because one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is what would happen that the Pharisees, the scribes, the religious elites would in just a few days take Jesus to the authorities and say, kill this guy. He should be crucified. Now, we know the answer. They say, like, well, he thinks he's God. He's telling everybody he's God. And that's obviously part of the equation. But even a couple of weeks ago, we read earlier in Matthew that there were plenty of people that called themselves gods, plenty of people that were claiming to be deities. Even it was on their coinage, who they are. I am the God, I'm the Prince of Peace. So there were plenty of people claiming to be gods. What would really drive somebody to say, kill that man? And I think what would drive somebody, at least would drive me to say, kill that person, is if that man came along and said, hey, watch out for them. They're not gonna practice what they preach. And you go, you can't say that to me. And then Jesus said, oh, really? 
I'm gonna take the next few minutes and just pull off some of your masks and show everybody who you really are. Now, all of a sudden in me, I go, well, I wouldn't kill somebody for that. Really? In my heart, there have been plenty of times where if, if you were to say, hey, I'm gonna expose you for who you really are. I'm gonna expose the thoughts that you've had about those people. The whole world's gonna know what you've actually been searching. The whole world's gonna know your bank account and the way that you spend your money. The whole world's gonna know the language that you use behind closed doors and the things that you dream about that no, you don't think anybody knows about. I'm gonna reveal it to everybody. Everyone's about to know. Isn't there a part of you that goes, then I'm out of here. Let me run. Like, I may not actually want to kill somebody, but I am definitely out of here. Why? Because if that became known, it would kill me. And so is it possible that as Jesus is looking at the Pharisees going, who you say you are is not who you are, and I'm about to reveal it. They said, no, you're not. And we will kill you if you try. Why? Because they're gonna lose power? Sure. Why? Because they've built this entire establishment upon the mask that they're wearing? Sure. But can we also give them some grace, like the grace that I need to go, and some of it's because they were terrified of who they actually were. And they're going, if people know nobody would pay attention to me. So here's what we have to do in the next few moments as Jesus turns to these men and says, woe to you, you hypocrites. He's going, as I take off this mask and reveal who you are, I understand that you're gonna say, kill that man. But I will be killed so you can be known. Some of you this morning need to hear the gospel in its most basic form is he goes, I will be killed so you can be known. And you're going, oh, of course, of course. Don't rush by that. For you to be able to come before the creator of the universe and say, God, know me. I understand though, for me to be known means you will be killed. So what does he say to these people who are so scared of being known? Again, I, I, teach, I taught a couple weeks ago. I teached a couple weeks ago. Hey, how great was that girl's uh, theology and the baptism? I accepted my life to Christ. You may have missed it, but I was like, I don't know if that's good English, but it's good theology. Like, I just accepted my life's in Christ now. Back to the sermon. Um, uh, you can't do all of these, so I'm gonna ask you not to. Don't try to identify with all of the Pharisees and all of the masks that they were wearing because that's what a hypocrite is, correct? A hypocrite is somebody who's wearing a mask. And so that's why I keep talking about the masks of the Pharisees. Of what are we wearing around that's just hypocritical and Jesus would say, hey, that's not who you actually are. And in trying to be that person, you're actually, you're actually stealing from the life that I wanna give. Ready? So I've just got a few of them, a few of the woes that Jesus spoke to these religious people and what it has to say to maybe us today. Ready? Verse 13. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. So the first thing that Jesus looks at is he goes, hey, the first mask I wanna pull off of you is just for you to evaluate, is it possible that you are shutting the kingdom of God in other people's faces, but you yourselves are unwilling to enter in? How would that look in our day's world? How would it look for a Pharisee to put on this mask in today's world? I can't believe that kind of person was at church today. Now, nobody would actually say that here could it be possible that when you get in your car, occasionally you go, did you see who was at church today? Did you know they go to church? I can't believe somebody like that would enter in. I'm just asking. Is it possible that occasionally, even as you're out in the community, the thought of inviting somebody into a life-giving community, whether it be at this church or at another, you're like, yeah, but there's no way they'd ever say yes. I mean, have you seen what they're doing with their life? Have you heard what they believe? Have you seen what they post? Do you know who they're following after? Like, there's no way they'd enter in. And it's so easy for us to predetermine who would and who wouldn't, who should and who shouldn't. But Jesus says, hey, that's not really the issue. The real issue is you've made up your mind and you've shut the kingdom of God in people's faces, but 
You yourself won't enter in. Is it possible that the hypocrisy, the mask that we wear, and I love you all, but we're a beautiful church. Like we look good. Maybe even some of the, (laughs) it's because you're like, don't say what you're gonna say next. But is it possible that some of us are sitting here going, they should never come but you've never actually entered in. You know the mask to wear. Oh, Fellowship Church, they kind of dress like this and they kind of do this and your cross, my free, like they got that going on and and you know the mask to wear, but have you ever actually, and I'm asking this because if you don't answer the question, Jesus is saying woe to you. Have you entered in? Or are you just going, I bet people like that aren't going to. People that have gone down that road, surely they shouldn't, right? But are we sitting here and going, have you ever actually entered in? And maybe some of you are like, oh, absolutely. Men's groups, women's group? Well, that'd be weird if you're in both. Men's group, co-ed group, like I'm serving, I'm building ramps, I'm, like I'm doing all the things. Okay, again, I'm not asking, and I don't think Jesus is asking, are you doing the right things? The Pharisees never left. They were always in the temple. They were always doing the work. The question that Jesus had for them is, but you don't enter in yourselves and allow those who would enter in. So maybe it's possible that you sit in the small group every week, but you don't ever enter in. Maybe it's possible you tell people about Fellowship Church, but do you actually enter in to the kingdom, the ways of God, the heart of God for you? Some of you maybe just for the next few minutes could go, Lord, would you take off that mask? And it's a spirit's work. Lord, would you take off that mask that I have been judgmental towards others, but I've refused to enter in myself? Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you're hypocrites. You're wearing another mask. You travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourself. So what's the next mask he pulls off? He's going, hey, woe to you, Pharisees. You're doing all the works of God. You're traveling far to make a single convert. That would be the word for proselyte. You're trying to find one person who will accept Jesus. And you've traveled far. You've gone wide and you found one. But the problem is you've made him twice as much of a child of hell as you are. And you might go, how is that even possible? Well, because you haven't taught them the true gospel, now when they think, oh, I'm good with God, and if somebody would say, why are you good with God? They say, well, because this person told me about this, but what you told them was wrong, so now they're doubly confused. But you're celebrating that I had one conversion. I think if Jesus was to rephrase this one for us today, he would say, woe to you, you hypocrites. You get excited about the things that I'm doing, but you're not actually proclaiming the gospel. You love celebrating the things of God, but you're not actually teaching them the gospel. Is it possible that sometimes we get caught up in numbers? Man, that church has got this going on. Man, that church, that ministry. And Jesus is going, hey, woe to you. You've made it more about the activity of God than the movement of God. Maybe what this would look like for you and for me as we get in our car and we ask a question, and it's not a wrong question, but I don't know what to do with the question. It was like, how's church today? Uh, good? Like, what's the answer to that? Like, God God was glory? Like, how do you, and and what I know what we all mean, like, well, did it feel good? Did the sermon, was the sermon entertaining? Did you laugh? Did you cry? Did the music, did you like it? But isn't that in some ways just kind of feeding myself? Was it good? Sure. Do that today. When somebody says, was it good? Be like, yeah, Uh uh-huh. I don't, what what are you asking? Wouldn't it be better if we started getting in our car and going, hey, did, did the Lord do anything in you today? Yeah. Really, what? Oh, it was a conversation in the hall. Oh, it wasn't 
This? No. It was, I met somebody in the hall. We were talking. It was awesome. Did the Lord do anything in you today? And here's the, the great thing about being in church. Sometimes you go, no, I don't think so. But he's faithful, so I'll show up again next week. Right? I used to help lead a lot of our life groups, and I would always say, hey, man, the pressure's off. Like, we don't need baptisms and sinks. I mean, we got them right here, but like sometimes there's so much pressure of like, well, we had a life group in our home. Like, did anybody get baptized? And it's like, Prob- probably not, and that's okay for you just to celebrate the faithfulness of God, not only the activity that's around God. Could some of you maybe say, hey, I need to take off the mask. I'm looking for activity more than I'm looking for movement. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. You're like, are we about done? How many did you actually pick? Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. You're hypocrites. You're wearing a mask. For you tithe, mint, and dill, and cumin, but you've neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, and mercy, and faithfulness. Those you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides. You're straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. So Jesus is looking at them again saying, hey, disciples, be careful. Why? Because they're wearing a mask at times. They're blind guides. This mask blinds them to actually leading you to where you think you want to be. Do you see why if this is really what Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, they're going, we have to kill this guy. He's completely exposing us for who we are. You're a blind guide. Yeah, I mean, I get it. You tithe mint. Like you're going around to different people going, hey, I saw that a mint leaf sprung up in your yard and did you tithe on it? Because it's kind of got some growth now. It's starting to have like some branches and I haven't seen much mint on the altar recently. So are you really following after Jesus? That's literally what the Pharisees are doing. Hey, I saw that cumin's coming in. I haven't seen a lot of the cumin. So what are you saying about your relationship with the Lord? And they're just becoming so legalistic about these little tiny leaves that they haven't tithed on. And he says, but you've neglected the weightier things of justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You ought to have done them both without neglecting one or the other. So yeah, give to God what you're supposed to be giving to God, but don't neglect the people that you're talking to. Don't you see how pharisaical that is? Like, you're coming after them about their mint. Did you ever stop to ask them, like, about justice in their life? Did you even ask them about mercy, faithfulness? Did you just want their stuff, or did you care about the people? Now, here's what's really interesting about the Pharisees. They would have said, well, the problem with justice and mercy and faithfulness is they're really hard quantify, but I can tell if they brought their mint. I can evaluate their relationship with Christ or with God. Maybe some of us too. We kind of, I kind of evaluate people based on what they externally show me. Maybe I say, I haven't seen much of this fruit in your life, but I ever stopped to go, hey, you haven't tithed on the Mint recently, can I ask you how things are going? Like, has financial hardship come into your life? Has something happened in your world that maybe that's why you're not serving for a season? Hey, we've missed you for a couple weeks, and we're not gonna cast blame on, haven't been in church, your seat's been cold recently. There's no shame in that, though. It's something going on in your life. And Jesus is going, they go hand in hand. Could some of us go, hey, let's take off the mask of going, I've predetermined what spirituality looks like. For some of us, we go, man, it is all about the heart. If you're engaged with your heart, you're following after Jesus. For others, it's all about the mind. If you can explain things, man, you must be following after Jesus. For others, it's all about action. If you're out serving in the community. But what those are, they can all be masks for me at least. The, one of the biggest masks I have to deal with is, is my emotion. I'm a very emotional person. And there are times where I have to really evaluate, is my heart stirred towards Jesus or am I just feeling a lot right now? And so it's really easy for me to look at some of you all and go, man, their heart's never stirred. 
they must not love Jesus like I do. Woe to me if I think that way. But woe to others if they go, well, JC never thinks on things like I do. No, no, woe to you. And others of you, if you go, well, I've never seen that guy down at the soup kitchen. Okay, let's quit judging exactly that the exterior shows you what's actually going on because they all go together. That's why we need the body. We need people that are heart, mind, and action to call us all to work together. You blind guides, you're straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. I read one translation that said, you're trying to keep in the fleas while the horses are running wild. And now can you imagine if you had a farm and somebody's like, hey, let's make sure we keep the fleas in, but their horses are out running wild. You'd be like, hey, I think you've missed it. The other thing the Pharisees, uh, Jesus would have been talking to them about is they were so specific on making sure everything in the law was correct. Every I was dotted and every T was crossed is how we would say it. And he's going, man, you are focusing on the gnat, the little tiniest parts of the law of have you done this dot? Have you crossed this T? He goes, you're focusing on it, but you're swallowing a camel. You're letting things into your life that just aren't supposed to be there. Don't you see the hypocrisy in that? Like, well, I, I did my Bible study, but I'm just letting these entire sins just rule my life. Now, none of us will be perfect, but are we fighting it or are we just saying, well, I did a Bible study, so therefore everything else I'm doing is okay. Could Jesus maybe just come in and with such grace in his voice go, woe to you if you think that's how the kingdom works. Don't fo focus on the little tiny parts of your life while massive things of your life have nothing to do with Jesus. I am convinced that one of the things the enemy would love to do, to men particularly, is convince us that lust is our only problem. Right? I mean, it's all men want to talk about. Well, lust, 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 lust. And it's a big deal in our day. But could our enemy start to convince us that's really your only problem, men? It's like, no, you are full of pride, JC. And you are full of shame and you've got to do work with those other things. You can't just focus on this one issue and be like, man, if I could just conquer this. Wouldn't the enemy win if he could just, just go, let's all focus on one thing and I'm just gonna attack you on all other sides? You hypocrites. You're blind. These are the famous ones. You ready? Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you're hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the plate. Some parents are like, I'm just gonna... Mount that in my kitchen. It's out of context, but I'm gonna put it in the kitchen. Clean the outside of the cup and the plate. But inside, you're full of greed and self-indulgence, you blind Pharisee. First clean the inside of the cup and the plate and that the outside may also be clean. Uh, right after this, Jesus is gonna talk about whitewashed tombs. And uh, I've often heard these taught together. Cleaning the cup, whitewashed tombs, because outside looks great, but the inside's bad. Um, but in looking over this, really what I see is that Jesus was calling out two different masks, I think, in the life of the Pharisees. They're not the same. Cleaning the outside of the cup and whitewashing a tomb are very different because he says to the first one in 25 and 26, he says, you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but here's the issue with this one. But inside is full of greed and self-indulgence. So I think Jesus was looking at these group of leaders and he's going, hey, here's the mask I'm gonna invite you to pull off today and it's gonna be costly, but I want you to pull off the mask if you've cleaned up the outside, but the reason you're cleaning up the outside is actually self-indulgent. You're thinking, man, I bet if my family was considered like this, people would think one way about me. Man, I bet if I was seen as a man in the community that did this, it's actually self-indulgent and greedy. Man, the reason I want the outside of the cup to be clean is for my sake. And Jesus goes, hey, would you, can I just grab that mask and pull it off of go, hey, the reason you're doing all these religious things is actually for, for you to look better. That's self-indulgent, it's greedy. It's not the way it's gonna work for you. That's actually one of those things I was talking about at the beginning of that, that's just gonna be a burden for you to carry around. There's a better way. The next one, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you're hypocrites, for you're like whitewashed tombs. 
We're reading it from the Bible app. Um, <laughs> for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanliness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. So this one's different. He goes, hey, not only are you a cup, some of you, the mask you're wearing is that you're cleaning up your outside just so people think rightly about you in a self-indulgent way. But others of you are like whitewashed tombs. Same idea, but a little bit different in that you've only cleaned up the outside, but on the inside there is death. And you've, you've done all the things that you know that a Christian would do, but you've never actually opened up the dead parts of your life and said, Lord, enter in. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. If you are here this morning and you've, you've been at church for years, decades, your third, fourth, fifth, I don't know, generation of church goer, but even as I say these words, your heart picks up a beat or two. You start to go, I do know all the right things, but I know inside of me is death. There is no shame in coming to Jesus later. None. Well, what will they think? That's not what we're talking about right now, you hypocrite. We're not considering what they think. We're asking, do you know life? Or are you just playing a game? This is a really bad game. I, do, I, I personally don't understand the Christian game. Why you would give up a Sunday morning and come here where we're gonna tell you, apart from Jesus Christ, you have no hope, but some of you are playing a game and it's not a good game. The game never ends well for those of us to just play the game. How do we know this? Because Jesus, after some of the woes, he says this to the Pharisees. He says, you serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? So he's not just saying, hey, let's clean you up. Let's see if we can't find a better way to life with Jesus. He's going, no, if you keep wearing these masks, if you keep thinking I can just do the external modification, if I can just control that a little bit more, I want you to hear that Jesus says, no, you're a snake. You're a brood of vipers. How, do you, how are you thinking you're going to escape this? When I expose you to the world, what's gonna be your answer? Another mask? Another Bible study? And I'm not against Bible studies, but please hear me say, in our church, in our culture, a Bible study can be a fantastic mask that Jesus might just in kindness and grace this morning go, hey, hey, hypocrite. Like that's a mask you're wearing right there. Are you okay if I just expose because I want you to be, I understand it'll be me dying, but I will die so you can be known. And if you go, well, he, Jesus is not very kind, calling people snakes. Or is that the most kind thing he could say to somebody who thinks they're somebody they're not? No, we're the righteous ones. No, no, you're not. So what's the answer? Uh, it's probably one of the worst words in the English language. Not that word, parents. You're like, good Lord, buddy. Um, but it's one of the worst words in the English language, at least for me. The only solution I can find to hypocrisy in the Bible is the word confess. And some of us go, because mm, we know, like it's a hard word, but it is life. And others of us go, because mm, we go, I don't want to do that. But it's our only hope that when we are found out and that when Jesus looks at us and he goes, hey, you're wearing a mask, the only solution is not another mask. The only solution is not to clean ourselves up. The only solution is to confess. I am a hypocrite. It's the thing that's said the most about Christians, right? Well, I would hang out with Christians, but they're hypocrites. Okay, well, then let's start confessing. 
Yeah, we are. We have done things poorly. 1 John 1, 1 John 1, 19 says this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How kind of Jesus to go, hey, as I expose you for the ways that you hide and the ways that you perform and the ways that you think religion will do something for you, as I expose you, that's what the spirit of God does, the word of God does, the people of God do, as you are exposed, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, all of the mask we wear. He'll do it. Confession to God leads to forgiveness. And so many of us right now are going, let's actually do that right now. Yeah, let's, let's just spend a time right now confessing, Lord, this is one of the masks I'm wearing right now. And we will spend a moment of just going, Lord, we wanna confess the ways that we hide from you, the ways that we perform, the ways that we try to do things on our own. But there's another part to it that I found. It's not unique, obviously, to me, but it's true. Confession to God leads to forgiveness, but confession to others leads to healing. Some of you, you're forgiven. Like if you're in Christ, you are forgiven. There is no charge that can be brought against you, but you keep wondering like, but why do I not feel healed? Because you've done a lot of talking to God and that's the first and most important thing. But I'm gonna invite some of us to take a step of faith this week into confessing to somebody else. Why? Because in confessing to others, there's healing. Therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another. Why? That you might be healed. Because as soon as you confess to another, the power is gone. I confess this to you. And you go, what just happened? I confessed it and I wasn't killed. It actually didn't kill me to be known. I sat across from a man or a woman, and as I confessed, I thought this will kill me. But it didn't. And all of a sudden, I go, there's some freedom in life. So we invite you this morning to confess, first to God and second to others. I wrote a little note to you. And then we'll end. Dear Pharisees, that's you and me. And if you don't like that, that's fine. You can, um, please come back, but whatever. Dear Pharisee, <laughs> you don't, dear Pharisee, you don't have to keep living like this. Husbands, you don't have to keep pretending. You have it all together. Pharisees, you don't have to keep putting on that subtle and sly mask of performance. There is a better way. I promise you, it won't work out in the end. I know the thought of lowering your mask and risking yourself with your kids, your coworkers, your spouse is terrifying, but there is freedom to be had. The things that pastor, your boss, your dad, your friend said are not the final word. Dear Pharisees, you don't have to keep living like this. There is a better way. Wives, there is no win in comparison. Dear Pharisee, don't you see that you're actually not known by anyone? You play the Christian game, but it's a really bad game. As a matter of fact, no one's gonna win this game it's only gonna to lead to loss. In the game of Pharisees, in the game that Pharisees play, there's only comparison and conquering. And it's a really sad game to play. Dear Pharisee, for all of your hypocrisy, for all of your legalism, for all of your sins known and unknown, for all of your fear and all of your demands, I will die. I will continue to be against the ways of the flesh, but I will die so you can be known. O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, how I long to gather you under my wings. Jesus, that's my prayer for our people. 
Jesus, we pray that we would just confess our sins and say, Lord, we've all done it. We're all hiding in some ways. We're all the Pharisees of today. And you've come and said, then confess one to another. So Lord, it's just steps at a church, but if, if we need to come forward and physically say, Lord, we open our hands to who you are, we do that. Or if we need to grab a spouse and just say, the most worshipful thing I can do right now is confess my sins to you. Or we need to find an elder. Whatever we need to do, Lord, we wanna be those kind of men and women who say, why would I keep hiding when you have died so that I could be known? Lord, give us clean hands. Give us a pure heart.